Rachel Madel from Talking With Tech. And I'm Chris Bouguet from Talking With Tech. We have a podcast dedicated to augmentative and alternative communication, all things related to helping kids with complex communication needs. If you have a passion for helping people with language disabilities, this is the show for you. Each episode features an interview or a roundtable discussion on a topic related to augmentative communication and helping people with language disabilities. And we're really passionate about giving practical strategies to clinicians working in the field who are working with children or adults, anything related to AAC. So you can look us up on iTunes or you can find us on Facebook. We've got a group over there or check out our website at bit.ly slash TWT podcast. Please join our community of professionals that are working to ensure that everyone can say whatever they want to say, however they want to say it. The views and opinions expressed during this show do not necessarily reflect the the policy policy or position of any affiliated workplace or employer. The views and opinions of the show do not constitute recommendations for therapy. Please Please contact contact a licensed SLP for individual consult on your situation. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. Communication is a lifeline. It's just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas, thoughts, or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families without it being lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations, and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science, episode number 104. We're proud members of the Exceptional Podcast Network. I'm Matt Hott. Joining us as always out in West Philadelphia, and I still don't know if that's true, but I always think of Will Smith. It's Michael McLeod. How's it going, buddy? Hey, Mike. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. Things are good. And from a special guest from the home of maybe former Patriot Tom Brady, <laughs> Tiffany Doc. Is it Doctor Tiffany Hogan? Yeah. Ah, we have our first <laughs> doctor on the show tonight. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, thank you for joining us. Who are you? Why are you here for the second time? Oh, well, you just can't get rid of me. That's I know, right? Thing. I mean, <laughs> I loved it so much first time. I just had to come back. Thank you for having me. I'm a professor um, out here in Boston at MGH Institute of Health Professions. I study speech, language, and literacy development, the connections between those, and I often work in the schools. So I'm very glad to be here. And also, you host your own podcast, See, Hear, Speak, correct? Yes, I do. I do. I do indeed. And um, I, on that podcast, I interview um, researchers, clinicians, teachers, principals, um, and we just have a conversation that might be interesting to other people. That is awesome. So let's start off like we always do. We want to hear from you at home. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. And from there, you can give us a phone call or text mm-hmm. message, 614-681-1798. You can email us speech science podcast at gmail.com. Or if you want to interact with Michelle or Michael, hashtag SS pod. You'll find us on the Insta chats, the Snapgrams, and the Twitters, right? Mike? That is correct. Do we have a TikTok yet? Uh, we don't, and we don't, and we do not need one. I am so addicted to TikTok, and that is a problem right now. That's oh, definitely really? that's definitely a problem. Oh, that's I, awesome. So I'm in this like Discord group. By the way, we have our own Discord. Check out the link below in the show notes. Uh, I'm on a Discord group where somebody is just dropping TikTok videos into it, and it made me have to sign up to watch. And now I can't stop watching TikToks. And there's even a uh, a hashtag tip talk which is like life tips about how to make food in the kitchen it's wonderful wow okay i look forward to seeing your your <laughs> tip talk video soon 
<laughs> Coming up on today's episode, we will have our hot take at the end of the episode. We are going to look at what Asha is doing for us. And also we have the informed SLP. Uh, our interview this week, I talked to Billy Fowler. Uh, he wrote an article in the ASHA Leader back in September titled Now Hiring Black Male SLPs and talks about his experience. And you got to listen to that because they told him on day one, Black History Studies was down the hall and he was in the wrong room. You got to listen to that interview. We're also going to talk about... Uh, Hands on, I almost lost the title there. Hands on learning how more play may improve kindergarten experiences. And Tiffany, you are here as well because we're going to revisit the article that we talked about in episode 102 about predicting dyslexia. But first, I would like to start us off like we always do now with our SLP shout outs. So if you have an SLP shout out, we want you to hashtag it SS pod shout out. And Tiffany, we will let you be our SS Pod shout out this week, rocking it as a SLP podcast host and working with future clinicians. So you are our SS Pod shout out of the week. I'm really honored. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm blushing. You can't see because we're yes. doing a podcast. It is an blushing. honor. It, I feel really honored. Thank you. Hey, you're you're one of three now. So we've done three. So you're one of three. <laughs> So if you want to recognize somebody, hashtag SSPod shout out on the Instagram, on Twitter. You can email us and we will read it here on air. Mike, do you have any other SSPod shout outs this week? Um, I would love to shout out um, our old friend over at the uh, the PTSD SLP. Uh, yes. she's been, she, she, she's always posting such great content on Instagram. She just uh, gave me a shout out later. She gave uh, Grow Now Therapy a shout out. Uh, so I want to give her a shout out on the pod. I know she listens and she is awesome. Rachel Arshambal. That's right. So funny story about Rachel is that she recognized me at Asha and I did not recognize her because I am terrible wow. at faces. And she was like, hey, Matt. And I was like, hi. And she was like, how was it? How's the trip? And I was like, good. And she's like, Rachel. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah, cool. Thanks. I needed that for a moment. Also, our favorite, my favorite part of the show, the SS Pod due process. This is where you get to air your grievances with us or with anybody. And we have one from Katie. She writes in, and then Tiffany, you'll be our other due process that we'll talk about in just a moment. Katie writes in, Dear Matt, my, uh, Michelle, and Michael, I've been listening to your podcast for over a year and usually enjoy your somewhat educated takes on issues arising in our field. <laughs> You're right. It's nice. usually somewhat educated. I'm an SLP in the Boston area and I'm highly connected with the ASD community and neurodiversity movement. I was very disappointed to listen to your latest segment on teaching social skills. I was agreeing with everything Michael said and was so excited about this topic that was being brought up as I am completely opposed to any ABA or over-rehearsed masking type therapy. I've had many conversations with uh, autistic adults who consider the speech therapy they received as children to be forms of abuse and mistreatment. I thought the conversation was going in the right direction until they brought up the social thinking graphic alluding to others' thoughts about you. The graphic and wording has been called out so many times by the autistic community that I was shocked it was mentioned as a positive. While I do pull from the social thinking curriculum at times, that specific technique encourages people to not say or do something out of fear or an assumption that other people might have strange thoughts. It is still supporting masking and not being yourself so that others don't think weird things about you. Our role as advocates in the world should be to help job interviewers, teachers, principals, and other peers, families, etc. to become more accepting of the other's differences. Can the listener work on not being so taken aback and or offended rather than putting all the work on the autistic person's court? Once we can realize everyone's brains are different and that it's not personal, we can work to see past any behaviors that might seem unexpected to you, but help someone feel good, regulate, or take off some of the demands they're already managing. I just don't think that chart or visual are all in alliance with the meaning of the article, and it was a gaping misinterpretation to think that would be a positive treatment modality to supplement that model of thinking. Uh, she says she couldn't stay silent on this, and if we wanted more resources, she would pass them on, and she did, so they will be in the show notes. And Katie and everybody else, if that was how our message was interpreted, that was completely our fault, because we agree with you. At least I will say that I know I do. And Michelle's not here this week, but I know she would as well. And Michael, I think you would do as well that we are not huge fans of ABA in the light, slightest. Yeah, I actually want to applaud her for that because mm -hmm. clearly clearly she was listening and clearly she was listening uh, very well. 
Uh, that was very in-depth. That was very detailed. And I, I love that. It shows that we have some, some real good listeners out there. Um, and also uh, what I have found through, through my experiences is a lot of SLPs really treat the social thinking curriculum like it's the Bible of social therapy. So for her to come out and say like, hey, this is not correct. This is not something you should be shouting on, on, your, on your podcast. There's a lot of things wrong with the social thinking curriculum. Mm-hmm. I, I applaud her for saying that because I could not agree more. Um, I, I think the social thinking curriculum has a lot of holes. Uh, and it is certainly not one size fits all. As soon as someone gets an autism diagnosis, True. you should not throw the that curriculum at them. Uh, so I applaud her for speaking out against it. So we do appreciate you writing in, Katie, and being our SS Pod due process. Uh, the idea of the due process, if you're listening at home, what it, what's aggravating you? What do you want to talk about? And you just need to get out there in the open. Do like Katie did. Send us an email. Send us a text. Send us a phone call. Or I guess you can't send us a phone call. Give us a phone call. uh, 614-681-1798 or speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. And by doing so, you agree that it may be read on air. uh, But no, Katie, we salute you. And the links to what she was talking about or alludes to are in the show notes. So let's get on with the show, lady and gentleman. Shall we? Let's do it. Let's do it. Tiffany, you're looking at us like you're like, oh, I didn't know there were all these new segments on the show. <laughs> I, I, well, I did know. I've been listening. I think it's super cool. <laughs> so not the SS pod due process, but what we are going to do is we are going to look at predicting dyslexia part du. And Tiffany, you happen to be the expert in this area because this is your study. Yeah. So you reached out to me, full disclosure, you reached out to me on uh, on Facebook, and you basically said. I said, I w- would like to clarify some of the comments made related to the article, because this stuff is a little tricky. And I really appreciated hearing you talk about it because it helped me to see through your lens, you know, how it might be interpreted or misinterpreted. And I thought this would be a great time to have a discussion about it. And for anyone that's wondering, this was also on episode 102. So we are batting a thousand from episode 102. But just kind of give a refresher. uh, The article, the way that we looked at it was a way to try to find a way to predict dyslexia in kindergartners. Mm -hmm. And the study was used off of research participants from Mm -hmm. years past. Correct? Yes. So this is the largest study that was ever done on children with language impairment. And it was a longitudinal study that started way back in the early 90s, mid to early 90s. And um, in the study, it was the study that that determined what was the prevalence of language impairment. And then they followed the children after the prevalence study from kindergarten, second grade, fourth grade, and then again, eighth grade, 10th grade, 12th grade. So even though the data set is a bit old, it's very thorough and people are still writing articles on it and mining that data set, which is pretty cool. Now, were you guys one of the ones that did the original data collection or was, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was a doctoral student when that data was collected. It was collected only in the state of Iowa. It's called the Iowa study, Uh, but it had researchers all over that were looking at the data. So I wasn't actually collecting the data, but I was with one of the primary investigators, Hugh Katz, Mm -hmm. and I was his doctoral student during that time. Okay. And one of the things that we kind of, we, we kind of went off on a tangent on when we were talking about that was that we looked at the link between phonological awareness and we may have down may have by putting it very wrongly, we downplayed the, the link between phonological awareness and dyslexia. So this is your study. Yeah. Tell us what we should have been looking at. And this is also proof why research is so hard and also i have to say writing is so hard because <laughs> <laughs> i tried to write certain things in the article it's very tricky i will also give a big shout out to the team on the paper this paper was led by crystal alonzo who was my past doctoral student and autumn McElwraith was our methodologist and then hugh katz my mentor so with this paper it's really tricky because we were looking at predicting dyslexia in particular in children with DLD, or that's, you know, the terminology now for language impairment. And what's been found that's confusing in this population is that these children that we see that have speech and language impairment in kindergarten, 
they tend to score poor on phylogical awareness assessments, as you would predict, but interestingly, only half of them go on to have dyslexia. So we over-identify dyslexia in this group of kids. And there's a couple of reasons we think that might be, um, you know. On, we, on students with phonological yes. awareness issues, deficits? Yeah, so okay. yeah, all the kids, I mean, basically the kids that have language impairment do poor on phonological awareness assessments, but only half of them go on to have a problem oh. with word reading. And so we were trying to figure out if maybe there would be a better way to assess risk for dyslexia in children with language impairment. And when we dug into the literature, we were surprised to see that phonological awareness is not the best predictor of dyslexia. The best predictor across lots of different meta-analyses and studies is this letter identification task. And I think it's been downplayed as a good predictor because it is a bit confusing. And I think it also risks the causation correlation issue. So mm -hmm. it's a good correlation, but it doesn't mean everyone should run out and teach letter names just because letter names is the best predictor. But it's it could be something we think about because I think it's it's human, right? To think like, oh, if this predicts it, I should change it and then the child won't have a problem. Um, so the letter ID task is also kind of confusing because it's just asking children to look at letters and say the names, that's it. But I've argued that, and I tried to argue this a bit in the paper, is that I think that task is less about letter names and more like a vocabulary test. Right. And it's also home literacy, because you think like, what does it take for a child to be able to name letters in early kindergarten, well, they have to have exposure to letters because they would never be able to do without exposure. They have to remember that a 2D object has a label and that like P and D are different and it's 2D, which is different than 3D. Um, and then of course they have to have, I think, some orthographic or letter memory too. So I think it's a complicated task, but what I really want to make sure is that it doesn't, even though phonological awareness wasn't a great predictor, we still know these kids really need phonological awareness intervention. And that part was tricky, really tricky about the article to write. And also, I just have gotten a lot of comments about the article that way. So I thought, oh, this would be a great forum to come on and talk about it. So I really appreciate it. Um, no problem. I, it's, I find it really tricky to think about prediction versus treatment just in general. I mean, I think I'd like it to be the same, right? What you use to predict is what you treat. But that part is really tricky. Now, I don't work a whole lot with dyslexia. I don't work a whole lot with the young ones. Mike, do you you work with the younger ones or is, is are your exec or your EF kids a little bit older? Uh, more middle school, high school, okay. college. So Yeah, and these are the babies cuz these are the kindergartners and you guys like older than 3rd grade is like geriatric to me, so you guys <laughs> <laughs> It's very different. Mike, but we're collecting say, Social Security next week, man. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Dude. You got that right. But, you know, this is this um, topic is really um, a hot topic right now for those who work with the little littler ones, like kindergarten through second grade, because now there's 43 states that have laws that say you have to screen for dyslexia in kindergarten or first grade. Oh. And Yeah, it's been really – we just have a new law in Massachusetts, so a lot of districts are contacting me how do I screen kids in kindergarten? And screening kids for dyslexia in kindergarten is at this point uh, more of an art than a science. I mean, there's a lot right. of nuance to it. So we were trying to add to some of that nuance, but it's it's just really tricky. Um, and then for the new clinicians or someone like myself who doesn't work with it directly, phonological awareness is really just the understanding mm -hmm. that if I say the word up and then say the sound k in front of up, I make cup. Yeah. And letter identification is literally looking at the letter M and saying M. That's an M. Yep. Okay. And a lot of times the letter identification task will even do different fonts to kind of trick kids <laughs> to see. Oh, really? Uh, so, you know, so it's kind of getting at their, um, the nuances of letter identification too. And that's what our task did as well. But that task is pretty common and, um, I think that you're going to see a lot of new tests coming out for identifying dyslexia, but I just don't want the kids that we see with speech and language impairment to be over identified or under identified, which I think there's a risk of both. Now, what's the risk with over identification of dyslexia? Yeah. So the risk I think that we have with over identification is that if you, and I see this a lot with the districts now, is that they'll give a test for identifying dyslexia and it'll identify like 70% of the kids. <laughs> and then it's That's like, good. well, that wasn't very good. <laughs> so I think it's credibility for one. And I think it's also resources. So it's, 
it can be a bit tricky. Um, t normally, I would say over identification is not a problem, but when it right. gets to, it's at a pretty high level at this point, so we're really trying to think of ways to be more efficient. Uh, one oh, of the I best gotcha. ways is to test again, you know, so you can like do the progress monitoring over time. Right. Well, that makes sense. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Mike, do you have any questions for Dr. Hogan while she's here with us for the study? Uh, I think it's all fascinating. Uh, <laughs> a, a, a lot of the work I do, um, these literacy disorders and issues with reading comprehension, listening comprehension, pretty much seem to go hand in hand with ADHD and executive functioning. So I, uh, so I, I see a lot of this, and um, I would love to dig deeper into the research on uh, why those two things are so often comorbid. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point, Michael. We were just doing, uh, uh, looking at a data set of children with dyslexia, and and we think that the the ADHD executive function is a huge missing piece. And we even have a lot of children in that sample that have no phonological awareness deficit, but their deficit is an executive function. So I think we always talk about children with dyslexia having this phonological deficit, but I think it, there's a lot more heterogeneity. And I agree with you 100%. I think 100, that the ADHD executive functioning and thinking about literacy could be nice. I think we should probably collaborate. Yeah, we much. should. We yeah. should. That's yeah. happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If if I had to assume, I would I would definitely say that uh, with with the literacy skills and the reading comprehension, uh, with ADHD and EF, the the issues with nonverbal working memory and the ability to kind of create that visual imagery, uh, I think that's that's kind of where I'm leaning towards why where the issues stem from. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because you can't, if you're not able to kind of lay down that track as you're reading books, uh, it's going to be very hard to <laughs> retain anything. And I agree with you. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, we want to hear from you at home. Uh, what's your thought? Have you read this? Are you Im are you impacted with the little ones or are you like me and working with the middle schoolers? Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Give us a phone call, 614-681-1798, or you can text message that number, 614-681-1798. Google Voice is wonderful in that way. You can also interact with us uh, on the Discord or through hashtag SSPod on any of the social media sites. We will monitor that. Our second article is coming out of the ASHA Wire. It's out of the ASHA, I'm sorry, the perspective of ASHA special interest groups. It's hands-on learning. More play may improve kindergarten experience for students and teachers. Uh, first, just personal, uh, we are actually moving our oldest next year to a different school that has a second recess. Oh, awesome. And I love that idea just from as a parent and from a therapist uh, standpoint. I love play. I love this kind of stuff, but I don't understand why it always works. I have a friend who moved to Canada and this study I noticed was in out of British Columbia. And uh, she tells me the biggest difference she sees is that they have three recesses. Ooh. Yes. They spend a ton of time outside. And even though it's really cold, and they're bundled up quite a bit. They also have a ton of nature classrooms, so they're just outside a lot. Yeah, well, looking at moose, you got to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But, 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 I, <laughs> but Mike, you're our EF expert. What is the idea behind play-based and language development? Yeah, so I think this is one of the things that we saw really start to decrease uh, when the, the Common Core was developed. Uh, as soon as the Common Core came out, and there was a, there was a, a major issue on uh, spreading the curriculum across the, across nationwide, uh, and more standardized testing came into play. That's when we really started to see a decrease in playtime and, and unstructured time. And now that we're doing much more research on the executive function side, and much more research into these this crucial age of zero to three, three to five we're really starting to see the importance of play and really what negative impact decreasing play had on, on these kids. And especially these, these early intervention age kids uh, going to way more structured preschools and seeing way more behaviors in the structured preschools than the ones that were unstructured that allowed for more free time and free play and free experience. So in terms of executive functioning and brain development, it's really, uh, it's really a skill in that frontal lobe is really developed through interpersonal relationships 
and meaningful experiences. So basically, during play, that's when we're uh, we're trying different things. We're learning through cause and effect. We're we're learning through trial and error. We're learning through interacting with peers and gaining their perspective. Perspective taking is key in executive functioning. Uh, it's really and being able to constantly get that peer models of of being able to work with peers when things don't go their way and seeing how they react and and learning uh, through through di- through different experiences aside from sitting down and doing worksheets and doing more structured activities, it's play that really develops the brain during this crucial time. And, uh, and it's not only academic skills that improve uh, more at this age uh, with play, but it's also these executive function skills of self-regulation and working memory and mental flexibility. Uh, it's really these skills that are improving when kids have the, the unstructured time to, to test these skills. The original art, the original article, the original study is called Randomized Control Trial of Tools of the Mind, Marked Benefits to Kindergarten Children and Their Teachers by Chris Lee, Peter Sefton, Andrea Lamb, and David Abbott. I am not familiar with the tools, so I had to go to their website, toolsofthemind.org. And basically it says that it is a early childhood model combining teacher professional development with comprehensive innovative curriculum that helps young children to develop the cognitive, (laughs) cognitive, sorry, social, emotional, self-regulatory and foundational academic skills they need to succeed in the school and beyond. Are you familiar with this previously, Tiffany? No, I I wasn't. Okay. Um, but I do think that, you know, we've been talking a lot with the schools here about how to incorporate more of these breaks. It's such a catch-22 for them because there's so m- many more uh, pressures, testing, um, different guidelines they have to follow, standards they have to meet, and yet they know they need to have more of the, you know, time for the kids. And I noticed in, in this article they pointed out that teachers also reported more joy and less burnout. So it wasn't even just for the kids, but the teachers benefited so much as well. Well, I know just working in the school system myself, I've been, I've been a a middle school, high school, and then I've also worked one year. I did one year of tour duty in the kindergartens, or I'm sorry, preschool Mm -hmm. and never again, but I've been almost 10 years and the burnout is intense. And, And I say that not as a speech path, but just as somebody observing the teachers that do some of the heavy lifting in the schools that, you know, the teachers look at me and say, Oh my gosh, you have 40, 80, 110 kids on your caseload. And I'm looking at them. I'm going, well, I don't have to grade 80 tests a week or teach to this math standard because I've got Jimmy over here who needs a lot of help. But Rachel over here, she's bored because she learned this in the first 10 minutes. It's, Burnout is real, y'all. It is. And I wonder if with this tools for the mind, um, if the teachers also just had a break, you know, a bit of a, a break in front of lobe kind of break for them too, that they could find some joy in it and not have to feel stressed all the time about what everyone is doing, but letting them have the free play. I don't know. Yeah. I think once the free play time was decreased, I think uh, it, it took a, a little while and we were able to see that uh, incidence rates for behaviors increased and anxiety increased. Uh, I, I think we've all seen it. You know, all of us mm-hmm. working with working with kids, we've seen a major increase in anxiety and behaviors and uh, an, an inability to kind of self regulate. Uh, and a lot of that stems from a decrease of of, of play during these crucial years. Uh, and th- there's a there's a great book uh, by Paul Tuff called uh, "What Makes Kids Successful" or "Why Kids Are Successful." And he starts the book by talking about this tools of the mind program mm-hmm. when he was sitting in a and an observing in a preschool classroom. And he kind of follows a groups of kids and tells different stories of kids that were in longitudinal studies. And it's really these executive function skills that stem from play during these early years that really help kids to be successful in the long term. I also oh, I wonder about the social emotional development. It seems like what you mentioned, Michael, about social emotional development, that can build that rapport with kids and teachers builds during that playtime. We're working in an after school program in our neighborhood and uh, the lab, and we go over and we build in time to just sit and color with the kids and play games with them because that's what builds the rapport we need to then have them buy in to working with us on things that are really hard. Exactly. For, it, st- studies have really shown that if a kid is able to have two or three or four teachers that they have a safe, trusting relationship with, 
someone they can go to and someone that they're okay, that they feel comfortable enough to fail with, to try new things, to not be successful the first couple of times before they succeed. It's so much more meaningful for a student to have those relationships where they feel okay making mistakes than to ever get an A on an exam. Absolutely. I worked with some really hardcore, great working preschool teachers. And when they would let the kids go on the recess, like even they had days where they were just using that as as time to just mentally regroup, where I could see that if you have a more play-based educational setting where the teachers want to engage, and I'm not saying these two teachers didn't, they wanted to, it, they did. But you could just tell mentally they were like, I need five minutes. I just need to find five minutes in my day. Um, and don't we all? Right? Yes, we do. <laughs> I say that, and I watched my son build Legos for 20 minutes today after I got home from work. And he was like, do you want to help? And I'm like, no, I just want to watch you, and you tell me why this car crash of a Lego scene is happening. And he did. It was pretty cool. Are you that sounds use, awesome. Are you, well, I'll tell you more about it after after the break. But are you – we're running out of time, y'all. Let's get to the break. We want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. Are you using tools of the mind? Let us know, 614-681-1798 or speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Coming up after the break, I sat down with Billy Fuller and talked about his article, Now Hiring Black Male SLPs. You're listening to Speech Science. Hi, I'm Mayling Chan. And I'm Martin Sibley. And we are the hosts of the Exceptional Leaders Podcast, where we spotlight high-profile topics and amazing people who are changing the worldview on disability. Even though we are oceans apart, we are bringing people from all over the world together to discuss inclusion, advocacy, accessibility, and real life journeys. So listen to the Exceptional Leaders Podcast to hear the voices and stories from amazing changemakers and be inspired to make a real difference in the world. This is the story of a very special woman. Just a few knew about her superpowers. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her Mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources at aarp.org caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Speech Science. I'm Matt Hot. Excited today to be sitting down, I guess digitally sitting down, uh, with Billy Fuller. Billy, welcome to Speech Science. Uh, thank you, Matt. I'm so glad to be speaking with you. So, Billy, before we get into everything, I found you on the ASHA Leader, but before we get into anything, I want to find out where you're from and why did you decide to become an SLP? Well, I am right now I'm located in Greensboro, North Carolina. I was born and raised in High Point, North Carolina, which is, um, I guess, locally said, a hop, skip, and a jump from each other. So it's not um, too far. Uh, my wife and I just had a conversation about this, uh, why I became an SLP. We, we constantly bicker over here all the time. But I, I, I really, the only way I can answer it is because I love communication. Um, I am actually a change of career, a career change person. I'm an older, older male. I'm 38 years old. I just had a birthday, September 17th. And so I used to work in retail management and I, I decided that we needed to change when our first child came along. And, um, my wife is a, she's a deaf education major at UNCG, go Spartans. For a kid. <laughs> and, um, she, uh, we, we took a look at it. My first notion was to go into the communications, um, the communications major as an undergrad. Uh, however, I, we, we talked about it and we just looked at the, you, I actually looked at the need for, um, you know, just to have young men and young women communicate to their fullest extent. And I looked at communication sciences and disorders and I looked at the program and I decided it was for me. Um, something I wanted to try, and I just stepped into it, and I've been in there ever since. That is awesome. I, I feel you on the jumping in mid-career. I left a career in radio and television, 
and told my fiance at the time, I said, this is your uh, golden ticket to leave. I'm going to drop everything and go to grad school and cross my fingers that it all works out. So and you're in, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I, we didn't have the kids. So like I could, that's even more terrifying. I've got two oh, now yeah. and that, that would be terrifying. So you're in your CF, right? I am. Um, I'm getting ready to wrap up in October. Um, so that's exciting. Um, I'll be certified for ASA and you know, through the state of North Carolina. So I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah. And where are you at now? Are you in schools or are you in a hospital setting or somewhere in between? Well, I'm in private practice and um, we have a couple of locations where we serve two charter schools in turn. And I've, I've been lucky, lucky enough to be assigned to one of the charter schools. And we also do home visits. Um, with, with a lot of our patients, so I have a lot of after-school children. But typically, my demographic is anywhere from preschool up to uh, 12th grade. I, I give you credit. I cannot. I, I started in a preschool and had to leave within a year. And I work with middle schoolers and adults. I cannot preschool kids. I I have two of my own. I can't do therapy with them. <laughs> <laughs> I so, think preschoolers are the best. But, do you uh, really? But yeah, oh. everybody. I, well, <laughs> That's well, why I there do. are people like you. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, however, uh, we have a nine-year-old. We have a six-year-old. She'll be seven here on October 14th. And we have a four-year-old. So it, it does wear on you at some time. Um, but I, I'll tell you one thing that keeps me in it, Matt. And it's absolutely this. The One of the greatest things is that having a – Having a little kid just come up to you and just hug you out of the blue. They don't know who you are, but they just want to give you some love. So it kind of perks up your day even if you're feeling down. Um, but, yeah, I think you have a harder job with the middle school. So kind of, <laughs> that's, see, that's a weird age. See, when the when the little ones come up to me and want to hug, I'm like, what, why are we hugging? What what are we doing? <laughs> so I, I guess, I, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no no! I, I guess it's just one of those things. Kids, kids, kids are very attached. They they want to they want to know, and they they're very physical. So I'm you know I'm not opposed to it. And I was going to say that's why there's so many SLPs. So that way, those of us that don't want to work in preschool can give them to you guys. And if you don't want to work with the middle schoolers, you give them to us. So exactly. <laughs> exactly. So Billy, you wrote an article in the ASHA Leader. This came out, I believe, on the first of September. It says now hiring black male SLP. Uh, I'm assuming you're a black male SLP, correct? You would be correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to get into some details and your perspective, but there was that story that I guess you told in there where the classmate asked if you were in the right place. Yes, yes. Um, that actually happened on my first day of undergrad at, 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 my, um, at my university. And it was definitely a awkward experience um i guess as we all you know sometimes as we all know it's a nervous anxiety that we have when we're walking into a new you know any type of new setting um i have to beat down the butterflies constantly every time i do it but um at this at this particular particular junction it was it was definitely a anxiety packed type experience and 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 I guess when it happened, I was caught off guard, but I was also, you know, gracious and I guess just at the time, just not even ready to deal with that type of um, atmosphere that, you know, I just say, okay, now I'm here to stay. Um, I guess that was my, that was my, that was my moment that said, okay, you know what, I think now I'm needed in a different capacity, I guess, of my my presence at um, the university in the class was kind of needed just to kind of give a different feel or kind of break the ice and let people understand and kind of dispel some of those notions that, that people have. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a, it was, uh, it w I wouldn't say troublesome, but it was definitely a eye opening experience. I, I was going to say, when I read that, I don't, I don't know how I would have reacted as, I was the only male in my cohort of like 24. And it sounds like you might've been the only male in your cohort of 30. Yes, I was. And actually it's just a funny side note, man. I was 
the first traditional um, black male to graduate from the program um, because I came in as a true, uh, a, just a true undergrad. And I was the first one to matriculate through the program as a black male. So it was, it was definitely a, it was a feeling of triumph and it was a feeling of like, man, we got a lot, we have a lot of work to do. So, well, yeah, it, the, it, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. I was thinking my first job, I worked in a predominantly uh, black high school. And one of my first freshman students looked at me and said, you're my math teacher from like six years ago. And I was like, <laughs> no, I just like, literally I'm there the first day. And they're like, the kid was like, no, I had you in sixth grade. And like his buddy's like, dude, not all white people look the same. And I'm like, what did I get into? And that was such... <laughs> And under like I don't want to say unnerving, but I felt so isolated being a white male in a predominantly black school setting. Was that the same way for you being the only black male in the grad program? Um. Well, I guess I can. I, I guess let, I guess the way I can actually let it just come across is this is the way I felt, and I I, I have so much love for this one professor is Professor Ramsey. Um, she was one of my uh, articul uh, articulation professors. Wonderful lady, sweetheart of a lady. And I would go, I, I would go to the mat for her. But this is what it actually felt like. It felt like she would have an ice cream social. And it felt like I was actually going to a sorority get together. It felt <laughs> like I was getting ready to join a sorority. <laughs> okay. that that's how that's how isolated I actually felt. Um, it uh, and it, it create yes, I felt isolated. Or um, another great point that kind of um, just you know brings up the isolation that you you know sometimes feel in this profession is that I was actually at the Asha convention, and as you know, a lot of colleagues gather around um, when everybody's not going to meetings, and it's actually it actually you know just sitting down, it's almost like being, trying to find a seat at the lunch table. And, you know, you, it's kind of like you sit here and it may be okay for a second. They get up and walk off and then somebody else might sit down a seat away from you and you not, you have a brief conversation. But it was never a, it, it was never a, a connection or a feeling of connection that was made in, in those settings. Um, so, yeah, I, you do get the sense of isolation. You don't, you, you know, some of the girls might go out. Some of the women might go out after class, and you're not invited. <laughs> so it's not, it's right. not, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> not that they don't like you per se, but it's just like, okay, uh, I don't know how you're going to fit into this particular dynamic. So we're not even going to ask. So yeah, it, it does, it does create a sense of isolation um, culturally. Um, yeah, it's it, it it can be very different. I was going to say like. Was that easy or hard to separate? Was it because you were a male or because you weren't white? Like I experienced some of the same stuff would be like, everyone's like, we're going to the pizza place. And I'm like, am I part of the we? And they would be like, aren't you going to go home and see your fiance? And I'm like, I guess. Yeah. Didn't yeah. want to hang out with my classmates. Like, <laughs> Matt, And I mean, I don't know. That's a great question. That is a, I, I, I actually sit down and I think about it and I try to parse out, you know, is it because I'm, is it because I'm a black and black? Is it because I'm male? Is it because of a combination of both? Um, but I will say this, um, I did, I did connect with a lot of, um, black females in my class. I, I actually had one good friend that I, I hung on to like a life raft because we connected culturally. Um, I did have other, um, I didn't have any lasting connections with any white classmate, female classmates. But on the other hand, we, I did have connections with some of the white male um, classmates that I had um, that were above me, mm -hmm. um, maybe a year or two above me. But we, but I really, it's really hard to just say because you never know what someone else is you know, what someone else is feeling or, you know, what someone else's apprehensions or, you know, um, you know, feelings might be towards someone. Um, not necessarily 
it was not necessarily a uh, malicious feeling or a malicious act that they were leaving me out you know you just you right, really right. never know yeah so it i i, I don't know I, I really wouldn't know how to answer that uh uh without just sitting down and looking at every single situation for itself now my question for you is that when i was in my grad program they decided to put me on the bulletin or the little pamphlet to show diversity <laughs> that we had male slps <laughs> Were you lucky enough to become a pamphlet SLP student? I let me see. I was not. I don't <laughs> think I were. I, I'm not. I'm not aware. I'm not aware if I'm. I'm a part of the. Uh, a part of the uh, pamphlet student or the poster. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm definitely. I, I know I have been. Um, I've been, and you know, I've been introduced, and I've been that person to be that contact person well well you know you can come and talk to billy and um you know he can you know he can tell you or you can shadow billy you know he's you know he's one of the other male slps or he's you know one of the black slps uh but yeah it's i don't yeah i don't think i have had that opportunity <laughs> at least i don't know <laughs> at first when they were like yeah come on down for the photos i was like oh yeah they're gonna do everybody and when i showed up it was myself uh it was one of our classmates that was from china and one of our Hispanic like grad students. And I was like, oh, this is, I'm not used to this part of the scenario. Um, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I, I saw that you had put in there that you were at a couple of recruitment fairs or something for college. Are you there yes, yes. as an ambassador for the program or are you there, or was, was this when you were applying for schools? Well, um, at UNCG, I, I've decided to um, be an ambassador for the Healthy Human Sciences um, Department. Um, I was there in the capacity of bringing awareness or advocating for um, our particular department as a whole. Um, that is the capacity I did as um, at UNCG as an ambassador. My recruitment efforts, however, um, that came in a different form. Um, it was at the community college level but it was actually a it was actually a offshoot I guess or actually an offshoot of a preliminary study that I did at the undergrad level just to try to figure out or find out um, how or what would interest more minorities and um, to the program and so I had the opportunity to um, at the community college level I had the chance to speak to one of my former professors at uh, the local community college GTCC. He let me come in and, and do a survey in a couple of his communications classes, but he also let me come in and actually just, you know, recruit and actually sit down and talk to them about the program, about the student and tell them and relate to see if I could interest some of the um, students that were, I guess, transferring or, you know, just going from the community college prerequisite courses onto their major classes. And so I did that. Um, in that capacity a couple of times and so that were that's where I see most of my recruitment efforts happen um, was at the community college level but also I've had the opportunity to speak at um, I have a younger brother and he's still in high school and I have a, I had the opportunity to come out for their um, for their college fair and just and just give props to you know the speech language pathology profession and try to get some of those younger students interested in and what we do. We're not going to solve every race issue tonight, but what do you see that we could do as a profession that there's always the talks? How do we get more males? How do we get persons of color? How do we get transgender to join into our field? What do you see as one of the biggest obstacles in the way that, like, I don't want to say ASHA, but just the field promotes itself? Because I never heard of it until it was just a, a lunch conversation one day and someone mentioned it to me. Uh, how do you see them bridging a gap? Well, I think it has to be, and I think I spoke about it in the article when I, when I spoke about being intentional, we have, um, we have a great networking um, and marketing, you know, team, uh, I guess at ASHA um, because because my company, they you know they continuously support uh, ASA, but I think that making it more 
I don't want to say popular, um, but that's the only word I can come up with is 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 creating a campaign um, that's more intentionally targeted towards minority communities. Um, um, HBCUs is a is a good one. Um, mm-hmm. But because we we do have we you know North Carolina Central is where I went to grad school at, um, and to be honest, the the department is not like the overall complexity of the com- complexion of the university. Um, but getting on those campuses and getting the word out, especially with social media and being intentional, following up with uh, with some of the minority students, just say, hey, you know, where are you at? And and just you know, plucking out those students that are that have shown interest, maybe have liked the post or anything, and just continuing to say, hey, you know what? Uh, you want to come and talk about this a little further? And just being more personable, having having more minority faces out front is is just I think it's just more of a just a deeper intentional way of reaching um that you know that that minority population that that will be better I think it'll be helpful in uh recruiting and retaining uh, any type of minorities in this in this field. I know I've run into when I work with students that I'll get a male student and it's the first time he's ever had a male SLP. And the student is so excited because they're like, I have so many questions. How do I talk to a girl? How do I do this? Have you, (laughs) have you run into the same situation where a student might say, Oh my gosh, you look just like me. What do I do? Um, Believe it or not. uh, I've had more opportunities to speak with parents um, about what do I do? Well, how do I handle the situation? Who do I need to talk to? Um, one great instance is I have a mom. Um, she's a she's an African American mom, and um, she has a a son that I see. Her her son is a client, and he's in the tenth grade. And um, she and she just feels at a loss sometimes. And um, she she comes to me, and we have we have talk. It's not um, anything. It's not anything unprofessional, but it's personal. And she, and she just related to me. She says, well, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, I don't know how to relate to him as a male. And so I've had parents even, I've had parents even a smaller kid, she, and just come up and say, you know what, I really appreciate you. You, show, you have shown, you know, my kid is, you know, my kid has so much confidence when he comes into therapy sessions and we walk down the therapy sessions that we haven't, you know, that he hasn't shown so, you know, how can we continue this? You know, so I think it's not now the students, yes, they do come up and but it's it's almost it's almost that they just want the attention and they want they just want to talk. They just want to they just want to be around. And I'm like, wow, you know, you know, so it's just that's that's that aspect with the younger students, but I see more of the you know how do I approach this situation or how do I you know uh, how do I you know um, navigate this this potential circumstance with the parents more so than the students. I I took to heart what you wrote in there where you said that there'll stu- there are students that'll climb onto your lap and ask you to be their dad, like. That is something that I think our female cope like counterparts. I think they they get in a different way, but it is definitely weird when they're asking about the dad part. Yeah, it's 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 yeah. I that and that, yeah. Not putting you on the spot, that, but <laughs> no, I, I didn't know. I, I I seriously, I I had to. I went to the car and I didn't know how to take it because I I didn't know what to say. Um, I didn't know how to react when students, when especially the younger kids, say that because I don't want to downplay any type of family relationship that that child may have, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to give that child any false hope, but I do want to give that child love, <laughs> and it's like you know, <laughs> and so it's like okay, I'm going to be the best whatever you need me to be. But I don't, I just don't know how to, I don't know how to separate that sometimes. And so, so it's, so sometimes sessions may go longer than 30 minutes because after that, you know, one client asked me, uh, you know, he, he asked me today, 
he's like, are you going to play with me? And I, he know he has awareness oh, wow. that the, the session, well, this is the session we're working on articulation for the day. And he knows that. But after the session, he's like, do you want to stay and play with me? You know, you want to, you know, do some Paw Patrol stuff. And I'm just like, you know, yeah, sure. You know, because if that's, if, if that's what, if that's what I can provide at that time, then that's what I'm going to do. Um, but yeah, just, you know, just, it's not any type of overextension or anything. I, th- some kids know that that's not, that's not your, you know, you're not my dad, but right. I, I want that relationship. And, 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 it, and, and yeah, man, it's just, it tugs at my heartstrings. And, and that's why I always just like, and I tell, I tell a lot of guys, especially like in recruitment efforts, especially with the older, older, older crowd is, you know, some of the older students that are looking at, looking at the profession is like, you know, this, this is sort of, this is, you know, not, this is what kids need. Um, not just black kids, not just white. This is what kids need in general. I mean, you know, they just need, sometimes they need that male confidence, not that mm-hmm. our female counterparts can't provide it, um, confidence for a child, but it, it's a little bit different. Um, in my opinion, it is, it's just, you know, it's a little bit different how we provide you know, just a, 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 a aura of kind of protection and just letting them know, okay, this is, you. it's okay. You can be yourself because, you know, we, you know, I'm behind you, you know, we're behind you hundred percent. So, yeah. Where do you see yourself in like 10 years? Cause it sounds like you would be op- awesome at the national level leading a diversity charge. Is that where you see yourself or do you see yourself owning your own private practice and, and changing the lives at the local level or somewhere else? Well, I, I really, <laughs> I want, I, I really want to look at all sides of what this profession has to offer. Um, but I really want to be at a place where I can affect and make change. Um, so whether it was being a Dean at the university, being at the national level, just pushing and, and making headways in diversity, then so be it. But I do see myself sitting down at the table with, you know, decision makers and say, like, hey, you know, guys, this is this this can work. You know, we can do this. And, you know, let's stick our necks out there for someone else. Or let's, you know, let's 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 lead the charge. Let's be the one to to make this change and make this push. So yeah, I could definitely see myself um, being in those positions because. So that's that's what we that's what we need. That's we need someone sitting down and saying, "Hey, you know, let's let's try this. You know, let's try this direction. Uh, we we've been heading in this direction for so long. Hey, how about we try something different?" So yeah, I could, I could definitely see myself, you know, making being being there, someone making decisions and and helping you know bridge that gap. When you run for national office, remember us over at Speech Science. We will uh, <laughs> we'll do your campaign yes. video or interviews. Um, last question for you: When you put yourself out there for writing an article, or you know, like what we do here on the show, we put ourselves out there for a lot of criticism because we're trying to be as honest as we can. What made you want to say, you know, what I'm going to write an article in the national publication, and I'm going to throw myself out there to be as vulnerable? as possible i was frustrated matt i was i was talking i was speaking to a colleague about it earlier today i was just frustrated i was um i I was i wasn't frustrated or upset but i was just frustrated at not having accessibility to people of diversity people who look like me and and sometimes i just wanted to let, let let others know i actually had a phone call today um, from someone who read the article, and and they they expressed they 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 expressed their gratitude first of all for you know me writing the article, and then they they said this is how I feel, and I'm glad you could relate to so you could relate that because I relate to it exactly, and they actually you know they actually broke down. <laughs> I was like, man, oh. you gonna make me? I was like, man, this is you know <laughs> this is I'm gonna cry, but it's it, it also just saying, look, hey guys. I'm here, he's here, he's here, she's here. You know, this is what we this is what we have faced and this is what I've been through. Um like I said, it's nothing 
against the profession. It's nothing against um, classmates or professors. People have been wonderful. Um, but it does, it gets lonely. <laughs> it gets lonely <laughs> out there. It does. And sometimes, you know, just having, you know, having sometimes, I guess, microaggressions that people are not aware of. And, and it, it's like, hey, sometimes, dude, you know, you know it's not okay. But um, but it's going to be okay. But it has it has to be confronted first. And so I I just wanted to confront it, and you know and you know, I guess let the chips fall where they may. What would be one of those micro uh, transgressions or uh, what what did you say? Uh, microaggression. Yeah, microaggression. Sorry, the speech therapist with aphasia right now. <laughs> um, well, one of those microaggressions would be. As I as I'm getting ready to um, as I'm getting ready to uh, matriculate and um, actually getting ready to have my degree conferred upon me, I've I've had um, someone say because my name is fairly simple, it's right. a very plain name. Um, say that you know I'm glad I'm glad you're you're one of those that don't ha- doesn't have one of those complicated names. Oh. Um, and so I was like, man, this is a wonderful day. And this is just <laughs> out of the blue. And so, yeah, it's just those, it's just those things that sometimes individuals may think that it's something that's, you know, savvy or, or, or appropriate to say that it's just not. And a, a lot of times it's not enough of a presence for, you know, of, you know, whether it's minority presence to, to, kind of say hey man this is not all right man this is not okay you, you know and so it it, it kind of just goes it just kind of goes away and you know things go back to normal but that was just one of those things that it, it really it affect, it, it kind of made me you know say man take a step back and say wow that was just a wow moment i guess i was not expecting that as your example i was i was waiting for something a little bit less crazy sounding aggressive <laughs> right yeah yeah but but i'm mad i mean it, hey you know it's sometimes it's just it's one of those things that that like i i guess that i'm not i'm not um I, i'm not i'm not against just putting it out there and, and saying hey man this is it really happens do you feel that it's a lot of the the microaggressions as you called them do you feel like it's more lack of exposure to somebody outside of your normal circle? Or do you think there's something else there? Cause I'm thinking when I worked at the, the predominantly African-American school, like I learned very quickly the, the slight vocabulary differences of what you can and cannot say. And then I started picking it up in people cause I coached uh, at the school as well. And I would start to pick it up and 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 people that we ran into for the team. So is it a lack of exposure, you think, or is it more? I hope you say well, the exposure and not more, because that makes me sad. <laughs> I, I, no, no, I just I don't. I, I guess it's just a lot of it's a lot of layers to that. Um, I, one, yes, it's definitely a lack of exposure. Um, two, it, it's a lot of unconscious bias. Um, that people have, um, my, myself included, um, that we are totally unaware of until we, you know, confront it or until we are confronted with someone that we have uh, unconscious bias about. So, and three, sometimes, I, sometimes I'm guessing that it's, it's a, a challenge, I would say, a challenge to the individual to say, okay, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'll give you a perfect example. And I love this. I love this man dearly. And I, and I don't think he has any ill will towards me. And he's a great, a, actually he's a giant in our field is Dr. Kemai. But uh, when he talks about dialectal differences between um, African-Americans and standard American English, it put me on the spot in undergrad. And I, and I did not know, you know, how to, how to come to con- uh, to answer some of the things, and I felt like you know maybe I was being put on the spot, but at the same time, um, I just I just think it was it was a 
I just think that it's it's one of those things. It's a challenge to say, okay, I know my stuff because Dr. Kim, I, he's brilliant. He knows his stuff. <laughs> um, but it was a challenge to me to say, you know what? Let me let me learn about you know all my dialectal issues. Let me understand that. Okay, I have to understand that. I want to learn about this and I want to know about this and, you know, I want to challenge myself to know more about this so I can come right back at you with a appropriate answer or appropriate theory to, to say, okay, uh, to combat, you know, your, you know, your question. Um, but the question at the time could seem, I guess it could, I guess it could seem like an aggressive challenge, but it wasn't now that I sit and think about it, I, I say, you know what, it really pushed me to want to know more about this and to, to, to dig deeper into, into this, into this field. So I can, so I can say, okay, you know what, you're right at this, at this junction, but from this standpoint, you know, maybe, you know, you're not as, it's not as, you know, clear cut, I guess. But um, I think though it's, it's just a lot of layers to that particular, um, to that particular question. You've been so gracious with your time. Is there something that you wanted to talk about that I did not get to or get to ask about? Um, no, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> but like, <laughs> I just, I know I'm just so grateful just to, just to have the opportunity. And it, like I said, the, the article has had a lot of positive feedback. Um, I'm so thankful to um, Carol for giving me the opportunity to write for Asha and, um, and just you know, letting letting um, our voice be heard. But it's a wonderful profession. It's a wonderful profession. It's uh, wonderful people in the profession that has shaped and molded my you know just my perspective. So uh, I'm just like I said, every opportunity I'm I'm just so you know I'm just so grateful and thankful to have it. That article again, it's now hiring black male SLPs. It was in the September ASHA leader. We'll have the link uh, down below in our show notes. Billy Fuller, welcome to the 3% of male SLPs. And <laughs> in the future, if you ever want to come back on the air, you are more than welcome to join us. Matt, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Hi. I'm Stephanie Munoz from the Informed SLP. If you practice in the NICU or coach parents of preterm infants, feeding is probably your number one priority. You look at positioning, timing, and the bottle itself. Well, at least for bottle-fed infants. One of your main considerations is likely flow rate or how quickly the formula or breast milk flows into the infant's mouth. Most pediatric SLPs know that the type of nipple, or teat if you're outside the US, that's attached to the bottle impacts its flow rate. However, you may not know that the manufacturer's labels of flow rate are often wrong and that some nipples vary a lot. This means that you can choose a nipple you think is low flow, that the package says is low flow, and then buy another one that seems exactly the same and end up with a high flow nipple. Surprised? Yeah. So this is definitely a problem, but there's some good news too. In 2019, two teams of scientists, Pados and colleagues from the US and Bell and Harding from the UK, have provided us with data to help solve that problem. They tested the flow rate of lots of nipples, both testing the exact same nipple multiple times and comparing performance of supposedly identical products. They studied brands like Dr. Brown, Medela, Similac, Infamil, and many, many others. Across the two studies, there's a good chance that you can access at least some of the nipples that they investigated. What both of these papers provide is basically a chart of flow rates and variability rates across all of these nipples and brands. And the researchers also gave a few tips to help you get a stable flow rate besides using more consistent nipples. First, be careful not to over tighten the bottle collar because that messes with pressure and venting and can cause the nipple itself to collapse a bit which then changes the baby's feeding experience and the flow rate. And also be careful not to overfill bottles. Just put in the minimum that's needed for that feeding because a very full bottle can actually increase the flow rate. To see how the nipples you're using stack up, check out the original articles in the journals Advances in Neonatal Care and Speech, Language, and Hearing, or read our review on theinformedslp.com. 
which includes a summarized chart of both studies. Links are in the show notes. The Informed SLP makes it easy for you to stay up to date on all of the clinically relevant research across the lifespan that comes out every month. Know what works to do what works. Welcome back to Speech Science, episode number 104. I'm Matt Hot, joined by Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? And Dr. Tiffany Hogan. <laughs> Not that kind of doctor. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's a doctor. So what did you get? So honestly, I'm looking at my clinical doctorate, and my wife and I are discussing if it makes sense financially, and I know it doesn't, but realistically, I want to just put down Dr. Hot on something. But what did you get your PhD? What was your your, stu your study reference for PhD? It's like, when did I get it or what did I study? Yeah, what did you study? Like, what yeah. did you focus on? Yeah, I got it at the University of Kansas and I focused on literacy and dyslexia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So perfect. So yeah. you're doing what you did. That's right. I was, I practiced for three years. And one of the things I noticed is that all the children I saw in preschool came back to me during the school age because oh. they had literacy problems. And I didn't have any courses in literacy during my way back when education. And so I read Hugh Katz's book, realized he was an hour away, met with them and joined his team and got the PhD. That's awesome. Michael, do you have any, any urge to go get a doctorate? Uh, no, oh, well, I don't. I do. I just don't want to do the research. Yeah, I would love to do the research. I would do all of that. I just, you know, it's just a bit of a time crunch. It is a timing issue, I have to say, because when I look back, I'm like, I don't, it would be very hard <laughs> to do it now versus then. Um, and I was just dumb enough then not to really know what was entailed. <laughs> <laughs> See, so. I, I, I should say this. If I looked at a PhD and I've looked at PhDs, I would love to look at the impact of AAC. Mm -hmm. versus a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And John McCarthy, Dr. McCarthy down at Ohio University, I've picked his brain multiple times and he's like, you should apply here, you mm -hmm. know? And I'm like, I have children mm -hmm. and I live in Cincinnati and that's a four hour drive. And uh, it's very restrictive. I just think we need to work as a field on a, a you know, a less restrictive model. And, but I also think that you don't, we don't need PhDs to do this. True. We need clinical partnerships. And so I think working um, and having boots on the ground is, is very valuable, invaluable, actually. I'm kind of looking at the clinical doctorate, but again, mm -hmm. I'm nervous yeah. because there's so many like online versions that mm -hmm. I'm not sure if like I get it from University ABC, is it going to be as good as Pitt or, right. you know. Mm -hmm. My luck is that I'll go get it from ABC and then the next year, like Ohio State will be like, we got a clinical doctorate now. Oh. And I'll be like, oh, really? Right there. Uh, is it, isn't podcast host just as good as I know. PhD? So, so the problem with podcast host is that it does not come with CEUs that bumps me up on my pay scale at work. Uh, yeah. I am in we the should, master's we eight should level, get CEUs not master's every plus 45. <laughs> we you should get CEUs for doing a podcast, honestly. We should like, definitely get CEUs Michael, for this. Michael, I just want to point out that so far in season four, we've had two episodes drop. And in one of the episodes, we managed to misinterpret two sets of data. Yes, I don't yes. think we would be passing the CEUs for that episode. <laughs> You did not misinterpret that. <laughs> um, frankly, but, that could I, also be on the writer. So, um, you know. When I pay money and I go to these CEU conferences, I misinterpret everything also. That's true, but you never fail then, so you're okay. Yeah, still, I'm still misinterpreting. Uh, what should I do? If we want to hear from you, head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. What did you think of Billy's interview? What did you think of the informed SLP that was right before this? Let us know, 614 681 seven. Nine eight. You can email us speech science podcast at gmail.com. I don't know if it was in there or if I talked to him after we done the we did the interview. And I told Billy the the thing that I was not happy with with interviewing him was that he was a CF and he sounded so much more in tune with what's happening in our field at like what was he? I, I interviewed him back in September. He's like 24, 23, 24. I'm like 34. And I'm like, man, I I wish I knew half the stuff that's happening in the field that you do. So good guy. Good guy. We'll be following him. 
our Asha Spotlight. We are looking at what is Asha doing for us. It is very easy to complain about what Asha doesn't do, workload, caseload, pay. But let's take a look at some of the stuff they are doing. And one of the things they are working on is the collecting patient stories on the impact of PD, PM, and PDGM implementation. That is our favorite thing. That It's the gift that keeps on giving to this podcast. It was like five episodes last season, all about PDPM or PDGM. But they're working on it. They're also working on uh, a Medicaid block grants to states, uh, looking at Medicare reverses the edit, allowing same-day billing of video fluoroscopy uh, for swallow studies by SLPs and radiologists. And we were talking in the break, Tiffany. We do need some of the stuff that ASHA does for us. Absolutely. We really, we are ASHA. That's the thing. So, um, you know, we are the ones that are, are uh, driving ASHA. So I think they do a lot. And it's, I think it's very cool that you're telling everyone what they're doing. We're trying. Now, if they could just give us free admission to the ASHA conference. That's all we're asking, Joe. That's all I want. We'll get there. If Joe, if you're listening, Come that's on, all yeah. I want. Come on. <laughs> oh, G Mike or Tiffany, do you have a hot take for this week? Because I do, if y'all don't. Cool. Well, it's your segment. It is it's not the, my segment. It is the yeah. show's segment. Last it's week I Matt watched Michelle. Tank. It is not the Matt Hot. I didn't name this everybody. Michael named this, but I kept it in there because I'm vain enough that I like a segment named after my last name. <laughs> the hot top the hot the hot take. The, the, hot the, the hot topic. It's where one of us <laughs> on the show looks to the skies, steps up on our soapbox, and tells you all what our thoughts are on something related to therapy or not related to therapy. And if you guys don't have anything, mine for this week is the constant aggravation on Facebook groups about the ASHA pack. And the big upsetness is how they give money both to Republicans and Democrats. And here's my oh soap. Boy. Here's my soapbox on this. There are people on both sides of the aisle that I hate. There are people on both sides of the aisle that I think might be decent human beings after they leave the Senate or the House floor or wherever they are. Problem is, in the situation that we are currently in as U.S. citizens, we need people on the Republican side in the Senate and the Democratic side in the House so any of our stuff gets passed. Because if not, we're stuck with stupid things like PDGM, PDPM. We are stuck with caseloads of no caseload numbers in Arizona where people have 130 kids on their caseloads. SLPs in Indiana have 140. You know, Ohio here, we have no teeth to our law. So I can have 80, but if a school gives me 100, they're going to get a letter that says, don't do that again to him. We need to give money on both sides as an ASHA pack. And I say we. I don't even give money to the ASHA pack. Maybe I should start giving money to the ASHA pack. But it, it goes to both sides to pass things that we need. That is my hot take for the week. Do you all think that I'm crazy? I think that was a great, <laughs> that was a great, a great Matt hot take. I liked it. Stop putting my full name to this. It's just the, it's just the speech science hot take. I don't want my name linked to it. Do you oh, see yeah. how, do you see how hot you get oh, while you say God, it? Yeah. <laughs> you better That's be careful point. what you're good at. You're good at this hot take. So I'm very good at the hot take. I, I think the hot take should just be the podcast. I'm going to be the Paul Harvey of speech therapy podcast. And I'll just record things and send it to other shows. And it'll be like, I'm mad hot. Good day. And there are probably okay, legit most of our podcast listeners that have no idea who Paul Harvey is right now. Oh, this is my world because I teach, you know, teach undergrad. <laughs> they don't know what I'm talking about. I mentioned Tom. I mentioned Top Gun, and they were confused. So, oh, I mean, are you going to see the new movie? Oh yeah, I can't wait. That's probably what I mentioned to them, and they were just like, "Huh." <laughs> so as we wrap this show up, Michael, I told you, I told, I would tell you after the break what my son was doing with the Legos. Are either one of you guys watching the new Lego show? I heard about it. I did hear it was good. I have not seen it. Well, I, what, I did what hear platform about it. is it? It's on? on Fox, I think. Oh no, I haven't. Seen so it. it's hosted by Will Forte. He was the voice oh. of Lego Batman and uh, BoJack Horseman on Netflix. Yeah. And basically, they're like supposedly master builders, but I have a real idea that they might be actors. Most people in TV and radio are actors. I don't want to yeah. ruin that for anybody, but. So they build stuff and then they have to describe the scene of what happens. And now my son has drug all of his Legos, all 
8,000 pieces of them to the living room. He will build car crash scenes or dinosaur attacks or monster attacks, set them up, and then describe them to us about what happened. And I couldn't be happier. That's like an SLP dream come true. Right? Uh, the <laughs> only thing I want to do now is get him a camera so he could film his own little stop motion videos. And then my uh, job of creating the next Steven Spielberg is on the way. Yep. And he could be a YouTuber doing this. No, and then no, no, no YouTube. <laughs> We want real money. <laughs> he doesn't need to give free content out there. His dad already does that. He doesn't need to do it. <laughs> like father like that. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Tiffany, you are our guest. What are you doing in the next week? What do you want to promote that is super exciting? Oh, it's also happy Galentine's Day, everybody. Yes. We are recording this February 13th. And if you are a Parks and Rec fan, it is Galentine's Day, the day before Valentine's Day. Uh, so we'll do that we'll look back we'll pretend that we're looking back what did you do on valentine's day tomorrow <laughs> any plans anybody is valentine's day tomorrow it Oops. is it is <laughs> i did celebrate valentine's day today i sent out really? lots, lots of gifts uh -huh. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, uh to my my gals to celebrate Galentine's. But tomorrow we have a tradition in my family where we do chocolate fondue because it's all about it's all about the chocolate. Yes, true. And that's what we do. But we dip in some fruit into the chocolate and we also have heart shaped pizza. I love it. Michael, any Galentine's or Valentine's Day projects? Pro projects. Projects. There we go. Projects like like with my students? No, like what you want to do. Projects. I I don't ideas. It's late, man. My brain broke in the executive functioning area. Uh, I'll be listening to speech science all evening. Oh. That's what I do. I will be I don't know what I'm gonna be doing yet. I bought my wife a coffee mug. A mini that mouse. Was a, uh, that, that was a worse answer than mine. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. It's a mini mouse <laughs> visits the parks coffee mug. So it's kind of a cool little thing. So there. Ha. Huh. Okay. Not that bad. I, I dig it. Uh, we want to hear from you. Head over to our website. How was your Valentine's Day or Galentine's Day? SpeechSciencePodcast.com. Uh, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash speech science podcast. Our Discord, the link's in the show notes. Phone number 614-681-1798. Or our email, speechsciencepodcast at gmail. Dot com. I feel like I need to record that one time and then never have to read that again. Maybe. Yeah, that's what, uh, that's that, what that'd I be do. awesome. That's what I do. I have to be honest. <laughs> I have my like ending fan. Our intro music is Please Listen Carefully by Jazard's License Under an Attribution and Share Alike License. Our bump music was the County Fair Rock. Copyright a John Deku. He's awesome because his wife is an SLP. Find all of his music at soundcloud.com slash dirt dog music. And our closing music, it's playing right now. It's the Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod. It's licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. In the immortal words of Janice Wright, Always be a willow. Don't be an oak. The oak will crack under pressure. The willow will bend and return to form. For Michael McLeod, the absent Michelle Wintering, and the awesome Dr. Tiffany Hogan, where can they find your show? SeeHearSpeakPodcast.com. You're listening to Speech Science. Until next week, so long, everybody. We did it. Awesome. Thank you, Tiffany. That was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. You guys are that was great. This has been an Exceptional Podcast Network production. Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at SpeechSciencePC and like our page on Facebook. For more original podcasts, please visit ExceptionalEd.com and rate and subscribe to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts.